what's going on, everybody? What's happening? What's shaking? It is Wednesday, April the 10th, 2024, 7.09 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My name is Dave McRae, coming to you live from the Voice Man Studios in Toronto, Canada. This is episode 251 of McRae Live. And I thought it'd be a little bit of a light episode, but something fun and something interesting. Have you ever noticed? One more time! Have you ever noticed this? The Exorcist 3, Child's Play, Brad Dorf, a little red-haired kid with freckles. Is there a connection? Was it intentional? If it wasn't intentional, it's got to be one of the biggest coincidences of all time. We'll see who rolls on in today and if anybody gives a shit about this topic. Keep it going! Yeah. <laughs> Keep it going, folks. Davey Death Ray is here. Congratulations to Davey Death Ray on his 500 sub mark. Ryan Oshlo is in the chat. Happy Sanjo is there. All right, we'll see. Uh, welcome, everybody, to episode 251 of McRae Live. Uh, thank you for joining me, whether you're joining me live, whether you're joining me after the fact. Like I said, we'll see who rolls on in and we'll see if anybody cares about this topic. I suspect there are some people that know what I'm going to be talking about, and there are some people that assume that I'm saying that... Uh, is there a child's play reference in The Exorcist 3 simply because Brad Dorf is in the movie and he's, you know, he's acting all crazy. Ah, maybe he sounds a bit like Chucky. That's not what I'm talking about at all. <laughs> for, for those of you that might be thinking that that's what I meant, maybe I should have been a little more clear on the thumbnail, um, but I wanted it to be a little bit of a kind of a... I didn't want to give it away for those of you that haven't seen it. Uh, and I think this is interesting. Now, The Exorcist 3 is a fantastic film. Uh, I mean, you know, in relation to where <laughs> it's not as great as The Exorcist, but it's 10 trillion light years ahead of The Exorcist 2, The Heretic. So um, it is a great standalone supernatural possession thriller movie that has ties to the original Classic, of course, and uh, it's a great film. And Brad Dorf, of course, is in the movie. Now, The Exorcist 3 came out, I believe it was 1990, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just double check this here. The Exorcist 3 was, yes, was 1990. I should have done this before I went live, but let me just check the release date of this. It was released on August the 17th, 1990. Let's take a look at Child's Play 2 because I believe that was also released in 1990, which it was. Child's Play 2 was released on November the 9th, 1990. Okay, so... That actually makes this even more fascinating. So, the original Child's Play came out in 1988, okay? The Exorcist 3 came out in 1990. Now we, all, now, we also have to remember where we were in the world in 1990. Uh, well, yeah, 1990. I mean, this is, you know, there was no inner... I mean, again, the internet technically existed, but it was... You know, it wasn't like it was a, uh, a common in the consumer, you know, regular person market, like in your homes. Um, so for all intents and purposes, there was no internet, uh, certainly no social media. Um, and, you know, it was, the world was uh, very different. And the ease of access to information was not as easily accessible as it is today. You've heard me say these types of things over and over again on this channel, but it's true. It's true, right? If, I mean, if you were alive back then, which I was, although, I, you know, in 1990, I was 11, so it's not like I was, you know, 30 or something, but I, I remember, you know, the 80s and the 90s very well um, and very different, very different. And so I suspect that if this wasn't, it's very strange. Now, unless there is an article 
with an interview with Brad Dorff that talks about this or William Peter Blatty, who directed the movie, talks about this. I don't know. Maybe I should have done a little more digging, but let's hypothetically say, like, I find this, I find this beyond a coincidence. Now, it could just be a coincidence, but it's really hard to believe. Now, there's a poll, there's a poll, and I got a poll up and it says, uh, only 43 people have voted, but it says, is it a child's play in Chucky reference or just one of the biggest coincidences of all time? Now, I have a feeling this poll is going to change from those of you that have already voted that are still watching. Because like I said, I think for those of you that are watching live and for those of you that are watching after the fact, I think, uh, I, I, I suspect that there's a good portion of you that probably think I'm just talking about Brad Dorff being in the movie. And maybe he's, you know, he's, he, he sounds like Chucky and some, that's not what I'm talking about, folks. I'm talking about a clear use of cinematic language <laughs> uh, that clearly is so on the nose that it's hard to dismiss. But here's the thing also, why in such a serious psychological supernatural thriller, why? If this is a reference to child's play, why? Does anybody know if William Peter, like, I mean, was he a gigantic fan? Brad Dorff was, you know, he was a, a, a character actor at that time. And he was, he, he was, you know, not, not a huge star. I mean, he's never been like an A-lister. Um, and there was only one movie at that time. When The Exorcist 3 was shooting, there was only one child's play. It was 1988. And it was a, you know, successful film. But it's not like there was this gigantic franchise and this all this nostalgia. And that's part of the reason why I think, and of course there was no internet, no social media. It almost feels like it was some sort of thing that they just did that, they never suspected would anybody would really maybe even notice because who could have predicted that the world would be so easily accessible and everybody would be scrutinizing and 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 analyzing every minute detail down to the fucking nose hairs and Donald Pleasance's nostrils do you know what i mean this is difficult to believe that this wasn't intentional and like i said if it's not then it's one of the greatest, biggest coincidences of all time. But it feels strange to do this in such a serious, psychological, supernatural thriller. Why? Like in a comedy, sure, knock yourself out, right? You know, but this is so, but like I said, I, I, if it is, I don't think they thought that people would maybe even notice. And some of you probably haven't even noticed. You probably didn't even think of it. Like I said, there's probably a good portion of you that think I'm talking about just Brad Dorf being crazy and sounding like Chuck. That's not what I'm talking about. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. There's a scene in the movie that, now, not the director's cut, mind you. There is a director's cut, but I think I'm talking about the theatrical cut. There's a scene in the movie where um, uh, um, George C. Scott, his character goes to, you know, see Brad Dorff, and uh, they're in the, the cell, and it's, uh, let's see here, it's about, I'm going to say it's about, it's close to an hour and a half into the film, and uh, I'm going to show it to you here in a second. And uh, Brad Dorff is, you know, he's chained up and he's got the, he's got the bandage on his nose and he's like, and he's going through his thing, ah, whatever, right? And then just as he passes out, he goes, he says this, he says, child's play, Lieutenant. Now that's not the reference. Although you have Brad Dorff, the voice of Chucky, saying the words, it's child's play, Lieutenant. Now, child's play is an actual, I mean, you know, we know what that means. So that in and of itself. To, but then it is a hard cut to a kid with red hair and freckles. And I'm like, you know what I mean? I'm like, eh. now the director's cut is cut a bit differently. So this leads me to believe that this hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink probably happened somewhere in the editing room 
Okay, maybe it was the editor. Maybe it was, maybe William Peter Blatty wasn't, you know, I don't think he was probably hip and 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 in the know of Child's Play. And like I said, at that time, Child's Play wasn't a franchise. It wasn't a big, there was one movie, it was two years back. It wasn't the big iconic spectacle that it is, to, spectacle, iconic character that he is today, Chucky. There is a hard cut, Child's Play, Lieutenant, hard cut to a redhead um, a redheaded, freckled kid in a wheelchair at the hospital. Hard cut. Let's watch it. Let's watch it. And you tell me what you guys think. Here we go. Here you go. Let me just make sure this is up. Okay. Here you go. Father, morning, please. Come on! I can't read this. Are you kidding me? Let's watch this again. Let's watch this again. We gotta watch this again. Charles, please. Father, morning, please. Come on! Here we go. Brad Dorf, the voice of Chucky. There he is. Very young at this time. Child's play lieutenant. Child's play lieutenant. Hard cut to redheaded kid with freckles. Come on! Come on! Now again, when you watch the director's cut, it doesn't cut to this shot. As far as I know. I haven't seen the director's cut in a while, but I don't think it does. Because uh, I remember specifically it, not, it being different. And then that's when I thought, oh, this must have been a, you know... Uh, this decision would have been more than likely made in the editing room, right? And, you know, and maybe Blatty, you know, he, he saw this, but, but he didn't, he, Blatty probably didn't make the connection. It was probably, maybe it was the editor who was like, this is kind of fun. It's Brad Dorf, voice of Chucky. I'm going to cut to the, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. Maybe Blatty was in on it. You know, maybe he was in on it. I don't know. But the question is, is this a child's play reference or is this just a coincidence? And even with the editor who edited the movie, maybe they just, it just so happened to be this way. They, they just, I, 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 if it is purely a coincidence, it's one of the biggest coincidences of all time. I mean, you have Brad Dorf, the voice of Chucky say child's play. Child's play. Hard cut. To, to Chucky, there he is. Jim, I can't read. It's that. Chucky, goddammit. K O R N E R. It's Chucky. So again, I ask you in the poll today. I ask you. The poll is: Is it a child's play in Chucky reference, or just one of the biggest coincidences of all time? Fifty-four people have voted. Fifty-seven percent say absolutely a reference. Forty-three percent say nah, just a gigantic coincidence. And you may be right. It may just be a coincidence, folks. It may just be a coincidence. But then that begs the question, who, if it isn't a coincidence, or even if it is a coincidence, who knew about it, right? And who didn't? You know, I find it very difficult to believe that this was a William Peter Blatty decision. Uh, and like I said, when he, he might not, he, he might not have even got the reference. He might've even been completely out to lunch, you know, when he watched the movie back, uh, you know, he, he probably said, that's fine. You know, he's not making the connection. Um, this might've been the decision of the editor or editors, you know, uh, probably one editor. Um, and they just kind of, it was kind of, it, it was a little kind of, you know, uh, an inside joke to them or an inside joke to whoever knew. That's what this feels like. It feels like an inside joke that William Peter Blatty, who was, you know, dare we say maybe a little more, uh, highbrow than, than child's play. Um, and I, I, I highly doubt that this was a decision that he came up with. Um, I think this is just, yeah. But do I think it's intentional? Yes, I do. If you're asking me how would I vote, I would say I think it's absolutely a reference. Um, and because I don't, because I think the director's cut 
those two sequences don't go back to back, it leads me to believe that this was probably in the editing room. Uh, and because at that time, Child's Play was, again, Child's Play had released, you know, in 1988. It's not that the world didn't know who Chucky was at that time, but in 1988, you would not, the, 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 the name Brad Dorff would, had not, would not have been immediately identifiable with the voice of Chucky. It was a different era. It was a different time. It's like in the 80s, if you say the name Robert Englund, yeah, you're hardcore, hor like hard, hardcore, you know, monthly subscription to Fangoria, going crazy, sweaty, horror. Sure, okay, they might, they might know who Robert Englund is in 1986, okay? But, you know, unless you're watching Entertainment Tonight or you're subscribed to Fangoria, you don't know. I mean, fuck, nobody knew who fucking the original Michael, I mean, you know the name in the credits, but, you know, it wasn't until the internet and, you know, these conventions and, and, and the ease of access to, you know, celebrities through social media and, you know, the free flow of information and sharing, you know, who, you know, which actor was this and those forums and group pages and, and you know, all, all that. That's what really connected everybody to the information. IMDB back in the day when they had all those forums and chats and things like that and you could, you know, exchange info and, you know, you know, look up stuff and Wikipedia. And I know Wikipedia is not always right, but I'm just saying there's so much information being flow in the eighties. Nobody knew who the fuck Brad Dorff was. I mean, nobody knew that, you know what I'm saying? Like, like you would not in 1989, you know, you would not have heard the name Brad Dorff and like, Oh, Chucky child's like, no, it wasn't like that then. It wasn't like that then. So I think this, I think that, that whoever did this, whoever, you know what I mean? Uh, I think, yeah, I think they thought that this was an inside, it was inside baseball. And it was, it certainly was. And I don't think they ever saw, you know, uh, predicted that there would be maybe, I mean, maybe they assumed it would maybe be figured out or caught on eventually. But I have a hard time believing, you know, that, that yeah, I, I just don't think they, you know, they saw a world where it would be out there. And it is. Again, if this was now, if you put Brad Dorff in a movie today, and if this same movie came out today, today, okay, today, and Brad Dorff, he's the killer, he's there in the chains, and he goes, child's play, lieutenant. And then it cuts to a redheaded, freckled kid in a, you know, in a wheelchair. The entire horror community be like, oh, come on, come on. Yeah, of course, because Chucky and Child's Play and Brad Dorff's connection and relationship to that voice and to that character is as iconic as Robert Englund's connection to uh, Freddy um, Krueger. Now, it's relative. I'm not saying that Chucky is as iconic as Freddy. That can be a debate. We can have that debate. But I'm just saying their relationship to said characters are, you know, are are just as iconic in their own rights. It, relative to their franchises and to the horror zeitgeist. And so, yeah, this kind of thing happens today, sure. But I'm telling you, back in 1990, and when The Exorcist 3 came out, there was one movie, one movie, and I don't think they suspected. I don't, whoops. I don't think they suspected that uh, this kind of thing would, would uh, hang on a sec here, would have caught on. Child's play, Lieutenant. Father Morning, please. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Unbelievable. Amazing. Folks, if you're watching live or after the fact, what do you think of this? Do you think this is a Child's well, like Play reference? Do you think it's not? Do you think it's just one of the biggest coincidences of all time? I don't know. Jump into the comment section below and let me know your thoughts. Maybe you have some information. And remember, this can't be information from Billy Bob's Fart blog or, you know, Jimmy Shooty Booty on Reddit. Uh, it, it has to, if you have an actual link to an article with an interview with Brad Dorff or the editor of, you know, on The Exorcist 3 or William Peter Blake. Laddie. I don't want to hear from Jimmy Schmickle 004.6 on Reddit. I, I, I really don't give a frog's fat ass. Uh, it needs, I want verifiable shit. Verifiable. I don't want rumors. But if you have actual source material from something, from a reputable source where this has been talked about before and, and you know, debated before, 
Let me know. I would be very curious to know. Uh, 64 people have voted, and it's pretty close. Is it a child's play and Chucky reference or just one of the biggest coincidences of all time? Again, remember, if you believe it's a reference, that means there is intent behind it. And who is the arbiter of... Who is the... Who's the person in, in charge of this intent? I Okay, let's discuss it for both sides. Let's say it's intentional, which I actually think it is. I don't think it's William Peter Blatty at all. I think it's an inside job, an inside joke from maybe the editor on the film. And I think it was very easy to get away with that at that time because, like I just said, nobody, I mean, you know, it was it was so, nobody cared. Nobody knew. Nobody was, was, was you know, uh, talking about Brad Dorff as, as the voice of Chucky in 1990 um, uh, or, or, you know, in 89 or 8. He was just, it's like, it's, it, it, it's like, James Earl Jones, although James Earl Jones was a relatively known actor, although he's pretty unknown. Well, he wasn't the he wasn't a huge huge star, but he wasn't completely unknown. But it's like James Earl Jones and Darth Vader, right? You know, now of course, well, yeah, I mean, he's synonymous with the voice, right? But when A New Hope came out in 1977, you know, uh, if you were to ask people who was the voice of Darth Vader in 1978 or 79, there probably wouldn't be too many people that'd be able to tell you, right? But but since then, because it became such a pop culture phenomenon and it's it's so iconic and it's you know and it's you know and all this information, we now know that. And James Earl Jones himself actually, you know, went on and became a pretty prolific actor but um but nonetheless i i i uh i find this interesting if it is a big coincidence then i mean you know i don't know i mean how do you how do you measure that i mean you know we'd have to know i mean was the editor a, a huge fan of horror and child's play and and maybe he or she did this subconsciously or something i don't know it's fascinating though it's very interesting let me know what you guys think let me know what you guys think all right let's jump over to the uh chat room and see what you are saying a couple of super chats came in Scott Bainey sends in $5, says, my opinion, coincidence, but I acknowledge that it is possible that it was intentional. Well, so Scott, why do you think it was just a coincidence? Seems pretty, I mean, that's pretty wild coincidence. Uh, let me see here. Uh, 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 Vo Trub. Oh, yeah, I think this is the, the French word, right? If I'm not mistaken. I'll call you Vo. I'll call you Vo. Hey, Dave, I want to thank you for wishing me luck on my filmmaking future. Uh, it means a lot to me, and I look up to you greatly. It's also great uh, seeing someone who uh, loves high tension as much as I do. Well, no problem, man. Thank you. And, yeah, I wish you the best of luck with it. And, oh, I mean, high tension is is great. Such a such a great, uh, uh, a great um, film. Uh, when I first saw it, when it first came out in 2003, uh, yeah, high tension is is fantastic. Mm. Very thirsty. Very, very thirsty. Very thirsty. Um, let me see here. Um, let me see what you are saying. What's going on here? Um... um Ba 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 ba. I feel like this must have been this must have been created specifically for the purposes of uh yeah, just you know, as I said, fooling people. Do you know what I mean? Fooling people. He was fooling. They're they're trying to to, you know, as I said, inside baseball. Inside baseball. Um uh, MKF30 says, I always think of Chucky whenever I hear Brad Dorf yelling. Yes, now. Now you do, of course, yes. But back then, no. Back in 19, I don't even know if you were alive back then. But, uh, you know, again, it's it, you know, it was a very different time. I mean, you know, back, you know, like I said, I I remember, uh, like, the the only way that, that, that you would get access to any of this information, like, literally is if you were watching Entertainment Tonight and they were doing some, I don't know, expose or, or some some thing on the new big horror movie or they were interviewing Robert Englund or, you know, whatever it was, or you were subscribed to Fangoria and, and uh, or you just went to your local, you know, magazine shop and picked it up or whatever. I mean, it's not that this information wasn't out there, but I mean, you know, it it's not like it is now. You know, nobody knew. Like, I, like you know, as I said, I mean, I I, I find it 
um, I don't say funny, but I, I, I just think it's important for people to remember, especially those of you that were not alive back then. Maybe you're a bit younger. You're in your 20s. Um, it, you know, as you know, it's not like it is today. You know, well, I mean, you wouldn't know because you've grown up, you know, in the uh, the digital age. But, you know, I was born in the late 70s. So, you know, I grew up as a young boy through through the 80s and as a teenager through the 90s. And, and you know, I didn't have my first email address till I was 19, you know, and, and um, so, you know, this, like the internet and the internet in the nineties was just, you know, surfing Netscape and Yahoo and just looking at Jennifer Love Hewitt photos. And, and, you know, I mean, it wasn't, again, it's not that certain things didn't exist, but it's, as I said, it, it's not like it is now. So in 1990, when this movie came out, nobody would have picked up on that. Child's Play wasn't, it was a, a movie that came out in 88. It was a successful movie, caught on. They did a sequel, obviously, in 1990. But um, I think this was intentional, uh, the way it was cut. I'm not saying that having a redheaded, you see, let me be very clear. I'm not saying that having the redheaded freckled kid in the movie is in and of itself a child's play reference. Not at all. And I'm not saying that Brad Dorif saying the words, it's child's play, Lieutenant, is a child's play reference. That's not, not at all. That's not what I'm saying. Because I think this is William Peter Blatty, who, who wrote the book that this is based on called Legion, he ended up directing this film. I don't think he would have done that. I don't think uh, it, it's too, and I say this with all due respect, it's too, be, it, 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 it would be seen as, as too beneath him to do that in a, at the time, a very serious, sophisticated, psychological, supernatural thriller. You know what I mean? It, it, it doesn't, like, why are we doing this? This isn't the fucking hangover. Like, this doesn't make any sense. It's not a comedy. This is not a spoof. This isn't Scream. You know, like in Scream, when you got Wes Craven dressed as Fred the janitor, and he's in the fucking Freddy Krueger sweater with a name tag that says Fred. I mean, this is not that, right? So I think that they just, it was opportunistic. I think that during the editing, it was like, oh, there's a redheaded kid in this movie. And Brad Dorif says child's play. Let's see if we can put those things together somehow and and edit this one right after the other. And, and it'll be kind of like a, you know, and it's going to go right over everybody's heads because it's 1990. I'm not saying they, but it, it's because it doesn't, it's too inside baseball at that time. It's not inside baseball anymore, right? You know what I mean? Because everybody has access to these things. So um, I, that's what I think uh, about it. I, I Again, I don't think that this redheaded kid was cast in the movie for a child's play reference. <laughs> Not at all. He's just a redhead. He's just a cute little redheaded kid with freckles. That's it. That's it. That's all he is, right? Um, but you put those two sequences together back to back and it instantly plays out like a child's play reference. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I think has happened here. I just want to be very clear that I don't think the kid in and of itself is supposed to be a child's play reference. It's when you marry the two together that you suddenly have this child's play reference and it was edited that way and I think it was intentional. I do. I do. And I think William Peter Blatty, who probably hadn't even seen child's play, went right over his fucking head. I'm making a lot of assumptions, but I think they're at least educated and informed. Uh, all right, Brandon Collins. Brandon Collins. Uh, sends in a uh, member chat and says, Blatty was pretty uh, superlicious and devoid, uh, uh, super silious, excuse me, super silious and devoid of a sense of humor. He was, he was, he was very serious. Plus, Alex Zuckerman was uh, an in-demand child actor. My gut says this was a coincidence. Well, I think it was a coincidence. Like, again, I think it was likely a coincidence that, it, that he was a redheaded kid, right? But the mayor, because again, when you watch the director's cut of The Exorcist 3, which again, a director's cut, as you know, a director's cut is supposed to be the, you know, the, the, the full unedited vision of the director without significant studio meddling or interference or, you know, no, I think we should take this out or cut it like this or, you know, whatever the case is. This is 
the ultimate, if the director had full say and final edit, right? If the director had, had, had final edit, this is what would have been released if the director was able to, you know what I mean? And of course, Blatty wanted to call the movie Legion and the studio wouldn't, no, they wouldn't. No, 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 no. It's gotta be the Exorcist 3 because Exorcist has the, you know, has the, has the name cachet, right? So, so if, again, if it was up to Blatty, a lot would have been different. So when you watch the director's cut of The Exorcist 3, if I'm not mistaken, these two shots, these two scenes do not go back to back. Um, so you would not have, and again, now you hear Brad Dorff say, child's play. Yeah, it's gonna, but in 1990, uh, I, I guarantee you there were so many people that watched The Exorcist 3 in 1990 that had no fucking idea that that actor was the voice of Chucky. I'm telling you, a hundred percent. I'm not saying everybody. I'm just like now. Yeah. Oh, look, it's Brad Dorf, the voice of Chucky. Again, why? Because Child's Play is such an iconic horror franchise and in the zeitgeist for you know nearly forty years. But in 1990, one movie a couple of years ago that you know did all right. You know, he was, the Brad Dorf's not a household name. It's not like it's Harrison Ford sitting there, right? So. Very, very different. And uh, I agree with you. I, I, I don't think that there is intentionally a child's play reference in the film, but I think that these two scenes, these two shots are married back to back. Well, hey, who made that call? And Blatty, as you said, Blatty probably hadn't even seen, Blatty probably went to his grave without ever having seen a Child's Play movie in his fucking life. Now, he would have been aware of the of the character, sure, because, he, you know, what? but I guarantee you, Blatty, as Brandon says, this is not Blatty at all. And it wouldn't be Brad Dorif. It's not his call. Uh, so, but do I think there is a possibility that the editor in the editing room got a saw saw this and was like ah, yes i think there's a possibility there but if it is a big coincidence and even the editor was like oh i didn't even realize i had no I was just, no whatever the case is then yeah it's one of the biggest coincidences of all time it's fascinating stuff Vo. Uh, yes, French for fear. Ah, there you go. Uh, by the way, uh, my my username's French for, oh, your fear, excuse me, combined. But you can call me Alex. That's right, that's right. I remember we having this conversation before. Also, have you seen Wreck and Seven? Uh, I watched them for the first time and I love them. Very intense classics. I haven't seen Wreck. Uh, I know the movie you're talking about in Seven. Oh, of course, it's a classic. Uh, Seven, I've, I've seen, um, I mean, it's one of the greatest psychological thrillers of all time. Came out in 1995, Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Kevin Spacey, directed by, um, uh, uh, what's his face? Um, uh, oh, God, um, why am I... Uh, <laughs> So what happens when you're almost 45. David Fincher, David Fincher, directed by David Fincher. Um, and yes, I, I, I actually had an opportunity to see it in the movie theater. Um, but I chose to go see Halloween 6 instead. Bruce went and saw 7. He went and saw the better movie. But uh, I went and saw Halloween 6, which was crap. Um I wish I would have gone to see Seven in the movie theater because that would have been really cool. Uh, yeah, no, it's one of the great, uh, great psychological films of all time. Uh, Carl Weidman sends in $5. Thanks, Carl. Says, have you seen the TV series, Chucky? If so, what'd you think of it? Um, I have not seen the TV series, Chucky. Um, I do not uh, subscribe. Where is it? It was originally on Sci-Fi, right? I don't get Sci-Fi. Um, and... You know, I'm I'm not I'm not against checking it out. I just I'm not a diehard Child's Play fan. So again, there's a lot of things that, and and I, and I don't say this in a pretentious way. Um, I think I've been sort of accused of being pretentious when I talk about this, um, but that's usually coming from people who are really insecure and they interpret my enthusiasm or lack thereof uh, in different ways. Um, but I certainly don't mean it in this way at all. It's just, you know, it's different strokes for different folks and you like what you like and you don't care about what you don't care about. There's nothing, you know, pretentious about it. Um, so for me, when it comes to horror, right, as you guys know, I'm very picky, very particular. And it takes a lot to get me excited 
for a horror movie. Now, that's not me saying that I'm better than you if your standards are less than mine. Not at all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that everybody has different likes and different dislikes. And some people have high standards. Some people have low standards. Some people are in the middle. You know what I'm saying, right? There are some people out there that really don't care about quality. I mean, they always hope a, you know, a horror movie is good, of course. I mean, nobody hopes that a horror movie is bad. But at the end of the day, it's not high on their priority list. They just want to watch a horror movie and some blood and guts and boobs and, you know, whatever, right? There's those people. And then there are people that are... Uh, that quarter that that I would say that have kind of been there, done that. You know, I'm nearly 45, so I've 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 grew up through the golden age of slasher movies, and and as a lot of you have as well. I know you know there's a lot of you out there that are my age and older. Um, and 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 I'm not saying that you can't be my age and older and still love all those films. I love all those movies from the 80s too, but. I just, I think as I've gotten older, my tastes have changed. My standards have certainly changed. Uh, what scares me has changed. What I find creepy and eerie and scary has definitely changed and evolved. And so Chucky is, like I like Child's Play, the first one. Um, I do like Child's Play 2. And then I watch Child's Play 3. I don't mind it, but I haven't seen any of the others. So... I don't, like, I'm, I'm not, like, there's only so much of a, there's only so much Chucky I can take. Because like most slasher horror movies, they they start, like, that first Child's Play was really creepy. It was really eerie and really freaky. When you get to, like, you know, Bride of, it, it's a shell of, what it, it's, it's, it's just a fucking circus carnival act. I mean, there's nothing creepy, you know, and I know that they tried to redeem themselves in certain things, and I know that there's a bit of back to form with this series, but... I just, I just don't care. I, I, I really don't. I, I'm, I'm not a big enough fan to care to check it out. Now, I do know people who have worked on the show because it shoots here in Toronto, and, and uh, William F. White, which is the company that Bruce works for, he, uh, his company supplies all the gear because uh, it's a uh, uh, um, William F. White, which I think they, they've merged with Sunbelt, so I think they're, they might. I don't know if they've changed their name yet or not. They might just be known as Sunbelt Rentals now. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, they're one of the largest distributors in Canada for lighting and grip gear and camera and all that kind of stuff. That's where we rented all our stuff for, you know, it's me, Billy, chapter one and two. And uh, and they supply a lot of the gear. Now, there are competitors, of course, but they supply a lot of the gear for the big shows that you see, whether it's, you know, Chucky or Star Trek Discovery or, you know, whatever the case is. Um, and so I do know a few people who've worked on the show and um, it shoots here in Toronto and, and, uh, and it's, and look, I mean, they've done what, three seasons now, I think, or something. So, I mean, it's, it's, it must be doing pretty good. Um, but the real question is, what do you big hardcore child's play fans think of Chucky, right? You know, I mean, it's one thing to get what I think of it, but I've only seen three child's play movies and I only really like the first two. So what do you guys think of, you know, I mean, really it's that question's for the Cody Leeches, right? Because he's a huge child's play fan. It's like, you know, that's where you, and I understand why, you know, you want to know, but um, that's where sort of, you know, you want to go and find out, right? Um, but yeah, no, I, I haven't seen one episode. Um, but three seasons, they must be doing something right. They must be doing something right. They must be doing something right. I do like that line in Child's Play too. How's it hanging, Phil? <laughs> it's good. I like that. Child's Play 2 is good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Hey, for a sequel, it's pretty good. And listen... Child's Play, 1988. Child's Play 2, 1990. At the very end, the very end of the, uh, you know, the golden age of, I mean, the slasher golden age, you know, began really, I mean, Halloween is usually considered the official kickoff, right? Even though there were, you know, Texas Chainsaw and Black Christmas, you know, four years prior. Um, but nonetheless, 
Halloween kicked it off and then Halloween, you got Friday the 13th and The Burning and, you know, and a bunch of these low budget horror movies that never went to movie theaters or if they did it very, very sort of select cinemas, you know, like, I don't know, like your, you know, uh, slumber party massacres and your, and your, uh, I don't know, uh, university high massacre, like, all these low budget, don't go into the woods, all these low budget, God awful, uh, you know, slasher horror movies in the eighties from filmmakers and independent production companies hoping to be the next Friday the 13th, hoping to be the next Halloween. Um, and so the golden age of slashers is really 78 to 84, 85, like really in there. Like A Nightmare on Elm Street was really the last big kind of thing that came right at the end. Now, I'm not saying that there was a stark drop-off <laughs> right? But, you know, if this is 1978, 1980, 81, 82, 83, 84, you're peaking at 84, and then 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, like, you know what I mean? By the time Halloween 5 and, and Elm Street 5 and, you know, Child's Play 2, and, you know, by the time the Candyman, Freddy's Dead, by the time those movies came out, Nobody gave a shit about slashers. I mean, the slasher subgenre, you know, the golden age of slasher, I mean, it was done. It was done. I mean, they're still making them, but it was done. And it wasn't until 1996, you know, six or seven years later, that all of a sudden, you know, thanks to Scream, there was this resurgence um, of the slasher subgenre. And then you get, you know, Scream and Scream 2. And I know what you did last summer. I still know what you did last summer, Urban Legend and, you know, The Faculty. And, you know, there was this, this big sort of, you know, resurgence and Halloween H2O and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't checked it out. I haven't checked it out. Uh, oh, a very generous super chat comes in from Josh McKenna. Thank you, Josh. You didn't have to do that, man. Really appreciate that. Sends in $49.99. Thank you, Josh. Really appreciate you supporting the channel on that level. You're one of our great supporters here on the channel and uh, really cool. Uh, Josh says, do you, th uh, excuse me, do you like watching revivals of older TV shows such as Roseanne, Full House, and Frasier? Since nostalgia is a, is huge now, is there any show you would like to see revived? This would never happen, but could you imagine the Cosby show getting revived? Oh, you know what? Great question, Josh. So I actually am a big fan of the Cosby show. You know, I, I, I can, I'm pretty good at separating the art from the artist. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm somebody, and I know that this is not a very uh, popular thing to say, uh, certainly on social media, although I do know I am not alone in this. Um, I I am somebody, and I've been very vocal about this on this channel, that, that does believe that there was a little something something wildly inappropriate going on with Michael Jackson. Uh, I know that there are his you know, defenders out there. And, and I know he was acquitted, uh, but so was OJ. So, so, um, you know, I, I do think that there, there is enough evidence, uh, and enough, you know, even when you talk to his housekeeper and you, you know, there's a, there, there's a very, those are my feelings on it. You're free to disagree. Of course. However, two things can be true at the same time. You can be, you know, uh, a horrible individual and do awful things and be a phenomenal entertainer. Uh, Kevin Spacey is probably not the nicest guy in the world. And do I think he probably got off and did pro probably some of the things he did? I mean, there's probably some things he didn't do. Uh, but do I think he probably was wildly inappropriate? Yeah, probably. But he's a hell of an actor. You know what I mean? Michael Jackson's one of the greatest entertainers in the history of entertainment. One of the greatest entertainers of all time. His music is phenomenal. His dancing is amazing. If I, I wish I could have gone to a concert in the 80s. I wish somebody would have taken me to a concert and, you know, his, his, his bad tour or his, you know, whatever it was. I would have loved to have seen him perform. But do I think he was probably... Yeah, probably. You know what I mean? That's my opinion. Now, uh, there are his, as I said, there are his offenders that are really rabid about it. Too. I mean, they get really hot and, you know, if you even say anything like that, it's like, you know, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Uh, but that's how I feel. So he's got to fucking live with it. Um, you're free to disagree. 
Bill Cosby, uh, although he said, no, I didn't do that. Do I think that he did? Yeah. Yeah. Now, he was, uh, of course, the statute of limitations. Uh, there was that one that, that, that of course, he was um, found guilty on. But do I think he probably did all those things? Yeah. Yeah. And do I think Felicia Rashad knew? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. Do I think some of the cast members like the younger kids knew? Probably not, because that kind of thing is usually hidden away from kids. But do I think Felicia Rashad had an idea? I know this is not the question, by the way, but I'm getting to it. Um, do I think she had an idea? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. A hundred percent I do. Um, so Bill Cosby, yeah, I think he's, you know, he's... Yeah, I think he did all those things, a hundred percent. But great comedian, great entertainer. Like two things can be... It's, it's often hard for for fans to disassociate themselves, right, from the art and the artist because they feel, well, that's not possible. He's Cliff Huxtable. No, he's not Cliff Huxtable. That's just a character he was playing. He's literally not that man. Now, a lot of the earlier episodes in season one were based on his, uh, his um, stand-up, which were based on things from his own childhood and his own family. And, okay, fair, uh, you know, but he's, yeah, he was great. He was great. And and the show was wholesome and great. And it's still, like you watch it today, it's still great, great messaging, wholesome. It's just ironic that you had a, you know, sexual predator that was, you know, the star of the show. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. It would be very difficult to, I don't know. They're not, if they would, you know, if they were to revive the Cosby show, it, you, you, you couldn't have him. I mean, it would have to be just all about Theo and his kids or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I uh, I did watch the first revival season of Roseanne and then I stopped watching after Roseanne left. So I haven't seen an episode of The Connors. Uh, but that's also when I had cable as well and I don't have cable anymore. Um, I did watch, I didn't watch every episode of Fuller House, but I did watch a lot of episodes of Fuller House. And that was fun. You know, there was a lot of nostalgia in there and there were some funny episodes in there too. So I really enjoyed that. Um, I have not seen the revival of Frasier yet. I know you're probably thinking, what? But you're, but the original Frasier is one of your favorite shows. And it is one of my favorite shows. I just haven't checked out the new Frasier yet. Um, but it is on the list. Um... You know, I think it would have been fun, maybe. But again, this is because of nostalgia as well. I was a huge fan of ALF, right? I mean, you know, uh, it's one of my favorite sitcoms of all time. Uh, came out in 1986 when I was seven. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny. Watching ALF now, I get a lot of my humor certainly a lot of the things I used to say as a kid from Elf. There's a lot of things that I used to say as a kid or as a teenager, one-liners or, you know, things like that, that, that I, re, you know, I rewatch Elf and I'm like, holy shit. You know what I mean? Like he had such an influence on me, that show and that character. And, um, I don't know if Alf would work today. Uh, Alf himself is actually relevant because, he's, he's, he's us. Like he's like a lot of what made the humor work so well is that it's, it's social commentary on just like the events of the day, the events of the time, you know what I mean? And so you could do a show with Alf today and he would just be as funny because he'd be commenting on the absurdity of the things today, like how he was commenting on things back then. So I think it would work, but that production on Alf was really difficult, really difficult. And, uh, I don't think they would do it today. I don't think they would do it today. But I would be kind of curious to see a revival of Elf in some sort. Maybe he's now, because uh, Max Wright is actually dead. He's he's died. And, and Anne Sheedon is is uh, is quite old now. And I think she's got a lot of arthritis in her hands now too. They're a bit deformed, I think. So, um, But maybe Alf is living with Lynn and her husband or Brian or, I don't know. You, you, you could do it because Alf... Remember, I think in the early seasons, he was like 228, but they all lived to like 600 and something. So Alf, I mean, you know, he's got like a 600-year life. Um, anyways, Alf would be interesting. Um, of course, you can't really, well, you can't do Three's Company anymore because Suzanne Summers is dead, John Ritter's dead. They're all dead except for Joyce DeWitt and Richard Klein. I know that um, the other two blonde roommates are alive too, Priscilla Barnes and... Uh, 
Jenny Lee something or other. Um, but nah, you can't do that. Um, I don't think so. You know, like to answer your question, like that's the long answer. The short answer is probably not, not off the top of my head. You know, there's some shows that are just best left just in the past, you know? Um, I think it's cool. I think it's, look, here's where I, like, I don't know if you're old enough, Josh, but back in the day, and it's not like this happened all the time, but they used to do, every so often, they would do like a reunion show. It would be like a one-off, right? And so they would do like, you know, uh, like an hour special, 10 years later, you know, it would be like, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think of what reunion shows there's been now, but, but that was a thing. I'm okay with doing like a reunion show. Do you know what I mean? Where like, say they wanted to do like a, you know, an hour ALF special, right? And it's, and he's, you know, living with Lynn and her, and it's a reunion show. It, it's, it's not a series. It's not a backdoor pilot for, you know, a series. It's, it's, it's just a reunion show. And so we who grew up through, you know, through that time can revisit with old friends spend an hour and now of course all the clips would be all over youtube and everything and you know i mean you you know i mean a reunion show would be with you forever you don't need to do a series it's amazing the connors have been able to get fucking six seasons out of this thing um i wouldn't mind seeing reunion shows again you know not not a series because i think what ends up happening is you know, the nostalgia wears thin and you realize that you didn't have as much meat on the bone as you thought, as much material, you know, and it was nostalgic for the first maybe five episodes and then it gets tired again, and, you know, and then you realize why you canceled it, you know what I mean? And, and so, but I don't think there's anything wrong with doing reunion shows, you know, but anyways, thanks for the super chat, Josh. Really appreciate it. Um, let me see here. Uh, Carl Weidman sends another $5. Thanks, Carl. Says, sequel. I think Michael Myers should be cloned from what is left of him, then sent into space. Yeah, why not? I mean, at this point, why the hell not, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Went down the wrong tube, as they say. Uh, yeah, why not? Let's throw, uh, let's throw Michael Myers into space. Clone him from a piece of his eyeball that's hanging there. Why not? I'm down. I'm down. Thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate it. I know I was talking a lot there. Let me just jump over to the other screen here. I didn't miss any super chats, did I? Uh, oh, yes, I did. From uh, Alex. Sends in $5. Thanks, Alex. And says, from a filmmaking uh, perspective, uh, what do you think uh, makes a slasher villain effective and scary? And can a tragic slasher villain be scary too? Um... Yeah, for sure. What do I think makes a slasher villain effective and, and scary? Well, it's a hard question to answer, Alex, because everybody is different. But you've asked what I think uh, makes a slasher villain effective and scary. And what I think is ambiguity. Um, I think, you know, keeping somebody an enigma and, and just mysterious, cloaked in an aura of mystique, I think is always interesting and fascinating. I think that's what I like about about Michael Myers, obviously, in the first, you know, couple, of, or in the f first movie. I mean, he's not so mysterious anymore once you get into the later sequels, but that's that's also what I really like about Billy from Black Christmas, the original Black Christmas, not the 06 remake. Um, and it's what we worked really hard to do on chapter one and two of, of it's, uh, it's Me, Billy, was to, you know, we got a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there was some criticism thrown our way and that's and it's totally fair uh because we showed billy from a different perspective that you hadn't seen before but people have to understand that in order to move the narrative forward we can't just do the same thing over again because then then what the hell is the point so bruce and i made a conscious decision to show billy and i put show in quotes because you don't really see him i mean you see his physicality you see his body but you never see his face you get a sense of him but we chose to do that because the question in our mind was how do we push a character forward that that the identity and why the character works is because of the ambiguity, because of the mystique, because he's cloaked in shadow, because you never see him. So how do we push that 
narr- like we're pushing everything else forward. We need Billy to be pushed forward as well, or it's going to feel like Billy's being left behind and everything may be firing great, but then the Billy kind of part falls flat because, oh, they're just doing the same thing over again. So how do we push a character like Billy? And you could apply this to anything. I'm just using him as an example. Um, how We th- thought, well, how do we push him forward? And one of the ideas that came to mind was the introduction of him in chapter one, which of course was in the original Black Christmas from 1974. You see Bill, well, you don't see him. Through his POV, You you he has a temper tantrum in the attic, right? He's kicking over the rocking horse. He's, you know, he's doing all these things. So in It's Me, Billy, the unofficial sequel, we showed a temper tantrum in an attic, but instead of showing it through the POV, we're showing it from a distance and you're seeing him at you know, the other end of the attic in this dimly lit sort of room and you know, you're not seeing his face, and you're, but, but you're, seeing his bo- you're, see- you're seeing him from a different perspective that you've never seen him from before, but we're still honoring the mystique and the and the and the ambiguity and the mystery and that sort of uh, that aura about his character and for me those types of slasher villains although I wouldn't classify although it's lumped in there for obvious reasons um, I wouldn't classify Billy and Black Christmas as as a slasher necessarily but nonetheless they're lumped in there to me it is the ambiguity that 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 rings true and 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 we continue to carry that through into chapter two as well there's i won't tell you what because it'd be a spoiler but there's there's another thing we do with billy um something that you've never seen before another perspective that you haven't seen before um which is again pushing the narrative pushing that character forward but still honoring the mis- the integrity of the mystique and the aura and the uh, you know the 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 um uh the ambiguity of the character um for the audience of what makes him work but it all depends on how a character is introduced right i feel very strongly about preserving that when it comes to Michael Myers or when it comes to Billy, because that is the foundation for which they were built, right? That's how we were introduced to those characters. See, Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees are not built on the foundation of ambiguity. We know from the very first movie, and we know more and more as the series goes along, but in the first movie, thanks to some exposition from Nancy's mom and Pamela Voorhees in their respective roles, we know who Jason Voorhees is. We know why he drowned in the lake. We know what, like, I mean, we know all about, we know all about this kid in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Nancy's mom starts talking about Freddy as the child murderer and the, you know, the lawyers got fat and the, and, you know, the judge got famous and, and, you know, it's a, we, we, we know there's, there's no, you know, I mean, it's, we, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying that to then do a 180 and try to make Freddy, um, Freddy's uh, aura, that doesn't mean you can't make him scary and keep him in shadow. I just mean in terms of like trying to create the illusion that we can't really know much about him wouldn't make any sense because you've already introduced a foundation where we know a lot of information about the character. Um, but nonetheless, either or, I think the best way to handle a slasher villain, whether you know a lot about his backstory or you don't, uh, whether preserving the integrity of his backstory and mystery is part of what makes him work or you already know a lot about him, whichever it is, um, keeping the villain uh, mysterious in terms of presentation uh, and scary and in the shadows, I think is really important. I think the more we see, you know, I mean, listen, there's no argument. There's no argument. Freddy and Freddy's dead is less scary than Freddy in part two and in part one. This is facts. I, 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 I don't know. That doesn't mean that Freddy in Freddy's dead, you know, the film d- does not have its fans, but I've never met anybody who thinks Freddy in Freddy's dead is terrifying. Nobody. He's, he, he's a fucking carnival barker. He's a loser in that movie. He is. Freddy Krueger is a loser 
in Freddy's Dead. I don't mean Robert Englund. I just mean the way the character's portrayed. He's on the chalkboard doing, like he's, he's, he's a fight, he is. He, he's a carnival barker. He's, th there's nothing scary about that movie at all. It is void of atmosphere, void of suspense. It is a terrible film. But part one and two, ah, yes. You know what I mean? So, but again, it's different, right? Like when we make movies, we tend to draw from our experience. We draw from our inspiration and that's what happens, right? Like I don't find Art the Clown particularly scary. Um, you know, I, I think, I think the first Terrifier was scarier than Terrifier 2 because it was grittier. Um, it was lower budget. Uh, I don't know what they shot on, but the color grading, the grain, I don't know if that was grain that was added in, in post or whether that was just grain because of of uh, uh, what they shot on and, you know, the color grading and you know, the timing they did. And, you know, it, 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 and of course, shooting at night in dark places, you know, if you're not shooting on the, you know, the red or the, or the airy or whatever, I mean, depending or this, I mean, depending on what you're shooting on, you know, I don't know what kind of dynamic range they had on their camera. Um, so if your camera doesn't do well in low light, which a lot of these cinematic grade cameras do, like the RED and the Airy and, you know, some of the high-end Sony cinematic cameras, um, that's why they shoot Hollywood films on them is because of, uh, well, not the only reason, but one of those big reasons is because of that dynamic range. Uh, and it gives you so much more room to, to, to play with in, in, in post. However, with a film like Terrifier, I don't think they shot on the Airy or the Red. And if they did, then they've deliberately made it look grainy and sort of kind of like it was having some trouble in some low light, but it worked for that movie because there was a, there was a, a, a low budget sort of dirty vibe to it. You know what I mean? Almost like it was like, it was, and so there was, I, I found the first terrifier a little more uncomfortable than not, not, not overly. I, again, I'm using this with a grain of salt in comparison to terrifier two, terrifier two was more polished, right? Higher production value, better camera, uh, you know, it, it, it was a little more polished and quite find it scary in terms of the presentation, right? In terms of how art was lit or how they presented art or how the scenes were lit, you know, whatever the case is. So we'll see what they do with Terrifier 3. But yeah, it, for me, it really comes down to, to, um, uh, what, you know, always do what you are inspired, like what, what you find, what you find terrifying, no pun intended, what you find terrifying, I may not. What I find terrifying, you may not. So always remember, you have to do what inspires you. Um, all right, let's check in on the poll. We've got 93 people that have voted. There, now, there might be some people that still may not know what I'm talking about here in the Child's Play reference. You'll have to go back and watch the earlier part of the stream. Uh, but 60% say it's an absolutely a reference and 40% uh, say, nah, just a gigantic coincidence. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Um, ba -da -ba -ba. Mm. Nothing like some good water. Nothing like some good water. Um, let me see here. Um, uh, did I, uh, oh yeah, here's Brandon Collins sends in a $5 super chat. Thank you very much. says, I just managed Tom Noble, the Oscar winning editor witness who edited this movie. Great. If he responds, we'll know he's still working at age 87. Amazing. 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 Well, Hey, why not? Why not? We'll, we'll find out. Maybe he'll respond to you and maybe he'll say, or maybe he doesn't even fucking remember either. He's 87. He's 87. He can still edit. He can still edit. Lori, Tom Noble is 87. He can still edit. Well, yeah, but Lori, Lori scared another one away. <laughs> uh, yeah, hey, you know what? I mean, maybe he'll, or he might not even remember. Um, it's good that, I mean, if, if he comes back and says no, it was a pure coincidence, uh, then, okay, all right, we'll take his word for it, but... Then again, he's 87 and he might not even remember and who who knows, right? But uh, we'll see. We'll see if he responds. We'll see if he responds. 
He's 87. He's 87. He's 87. Uh, did I get all the super chats? I believe I did so far. Uh, Carl Weidman. Uh, yes, I got that one into space. Got the uh, Brandon Collins one. Josh McKenna. Very generous super chat. Josh, thank you so much again. Appreciate that. Got that one as well. Okay, let me just... I have all these tabs open here. Let me just close some of these tabs. I don't need some of these tabs open. By the way, folks, if you're not following me on social media, please do. Follow me on, on uh, X uh, or Instagram or Facebook. All the links are in the description. Um, and remember, folks, it's it's my uh, Many Things Dave McRae Facebook page. So not my personal page. I don't accept... Uh, uh, friend requests from people I, I don't know on my Facebook because that's my personal Facebook page. It's nothing personal. Well, I guess it kind of is, but not in a bad way. It's just because I don't know you. So if you want to follow me, keep up. And, and I never post there. I think my last post on my personal Facebook page was literally like a year ago. Seriously, I never post there. Um, I always post on my Many Things Facebook page. I call that because the Facebook page is called Many Things Dave McRae. So just search for Many Things Dave McRae or better yet, just go into the description, click the link and follow me there. That's where I post. Um, and you can follow me on X and uh, Instagram as well. I'm trying to get to 4,000 Instagram followers. I'm a few hundred away and I'm trying to get to 5,000 uh, X followers or Twitter followers. I'm only like a hundred away from that. So uh, yeah, help me get there. I'd really appreciate it. And let's finally get to 30,000 on here. Jesus, you know, maybe I should start. No, I can't do that. I can't make promises I can't keep. I'll see if we can do it. Uh, Lee the Machine Bowers. Lee the Machine Bowers sends in $9.99. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate that. Says, Dave, my man, happy Wednesday. Gutter Garbs doing Friday the 13th final chapter shirts and hoodies. There you go, folks. You heard it here from Lee the Machine Bowers. Gutter Garb is doing Friday the 13th, the final chapter shirts and hoodies. And why wouldn't they? Because, hey... We're celebrating the 40th anniversary this year of Friday the 13th Part 4. And if you want to become a member here on the channel, just hit the join button. It'll be somewhere. If you're watching me on your phone, it'll be somewhere there. Hit that join button. Become a level number two member because this Saturday at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time is our next episode of Horror Movie Nights. And we are watching Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter, in honor and to celebrate the 40th anniversary of that movie, which was released on April the 13th, 1984. And this Saturday is April the 13th, 2024. So it will be 40 years ago, almost to the exact day. Well, I mean, it is the exact day, but it's a Saturday instead of a Friday. But nonetheless, we'll be doing that. So make sure you uh, do that if you want to if, if you want to do that. Uh, Mark Burns sends in four ninety nine. says, you make me laugh. Well, that's good, Mark. That's good. I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> we could all have a good laugh. We all need to just bust it out there. <laughs> we all need to just get it out. Just get it out. That's what we need to do. Davey Deathray, my man. And, and again, congratulations to Davey Deathray, who just crossed 500 subscribers on his channel. I like the first couple Saw movies, but once I realized that there's always going to be a twist, I started to lose interest. And I can hardly tell the difference between uh, Strame and Hoffman. Strame, Stram, Straham. Is that how you pronounce that? And Hoffman, I'm phonetically sounding it out. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, Saw, Saw is a franchise that I wish I liked more than I did because I do know there's a lot of Saw fans. I also w wish I liked Scream more than I did because I know there's a lot of Scream heads out there. Uh, and when I say I don't, uh, I wish I liked them more than I did, I, I don't mean I don't like them. I just mean, I wish I liked them, say, as much as Halloween, right? Um... Yeah, Saw's, a, a, I, I like the first Saw. I, I like the first couple of Saw's. Um, but I think the last Saw movie I ever watched was like Saw 4. I think I saw that in the theater. And I think, I remember specifically, this is my experience with Saw. As you guys know, when Saw came out in 2004, it was a huge hit for James Wan. And then for and then in 2005, six, seven, eight, not like for the next four or five years at Halloween time, it became a staple. They would release a Saw movie. And at that time, I remember being very like just annoyed with it 
Like, I just, you know, I just remember thinking, like, fuck, like, do something else. You know what I mean? Like, oh, God, I'm going to saw 38. You know what I mean? I kind of always been that way, I guess. Um, I don't know. I, I, and I feel bad, but I know I shouldn't feel bad, but I guess I say that because I do know that there is a large portion of my audience, not, not everybody, but I do know there's a lot of people that watch me that maybe wish I covered more of that stuff or, you know, got more excited about these, all these sequels and things like that. And I'm just, I just can't, you know, I gotta be me, you know, and, and it's not that I can't find value and stuff, but, and it's not that I don't appreciate a good sequel. It's not sequels in and of themselves. It's sequel after sequel, after sequel, after like, that's where it kind of, do you know what I mean? Like, I just don't, you know, like somebody asked me, a while ago, they said, hey, you know what? You're doing It's Me, Billy, chapter two. This is great. Uh, are you going to do, you know, chapter three? And I'm like, God, no. Now, I can't stop anybody else who wants to do it. I mean, to live up to it, you you know, you got to shoot it. You know, you got to do it pro. <laughs> you know, you can't just do, well, I mean, I, I guess you could do one on your iPhone, but uh, it's probably not going to go over well with, you know, with people. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know, no. There is no more story to tell. Like, I'm perfectly content with ending it there. Now, I do, again, I, I, I know how the system works, and I know that the reason why studios make sequels is because of money. It's show business, and they make a lot of money, so they continue to make sequels. Of course, of course, of course, of course. I, I understand. I get it. I get it. But uh, that's where I, if I was ever involved in a situation like that, like like if, if It's Me, if it's me Billy, Chapter one and chapter two. Let's say they were studio released movies. I know that studios don't release short films like that. But let's say they did, just for the sake of argument. And It's Me, Billy, big success. Oh, this is great. You know, it was fantastic, Dave. Want to come back? You, you, know, you, know, you want to finish the story? I'd love to finish the story. Let's do chapter two. Okay, Bruce, we're doing chapter two, which we are. We're doing chapter two. When chapter two comes out, if everybody really likes it and they love how we've wrapped up the story and everything... If a studio was like, Dave, Dave, you gotta come back, you want to do chapter three. I, I would be like, no, I, I don't, why? It, I'm done, I'm out. You know what I mean? Like, even if it was good money, even if it was like, oh, but we're gonna, I'm like, nah. because I've always, ever since I've been a little kid, I've always really been, and if you're like me, you know this, you're really about the work. You're really about the art. And I don't mean that in a highbrow way. I just mean that like you really care about the product. You really care about the work and 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 making a good story and 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 having me getting, you know, and 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 not doing shit and, and not phoning things in and just doing it for the money. I've never been that kind of person. And so I think that's part of why I, I just get so like, oh God, saw 58. I don't care. I just don't care. And I feel bad sometimes because I do know there's a lot of people that really do care about that. And I wish I could get excited for that, you know, but I just, I can't. It's, it, it's, that doesn't mean that the movie's not going to be good. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that I could not watch be like, this is actually great. I'm not saying that my apprehension or, or uh, you know, disdain for 55 sequels is because I think they're all going to be terrible. Um, I actually like the idea of legacy sequels. I do. I, I think there's opportunity there to create something really special. I mean, listen, I know It's Me, Billy is a fan film, and I know it's unofficial, but as a lot of you know, we shot it pro. It's a professional short film. It's a professional indie film. It's a short film, but it's professional. And It's Me, Billy Chapter 2 will be the same. And look what we were able to do, right? And there's a lot of people that come forward and say, this is what the Blumhouse remake should have been. This is what we should have got with a studio release. Like this direction, this kind of, you know what I mean? Honoring the original. I agree. I agree. Like, I like the idea. There's opportunity there to do something special, to tip your hat, to pay tribute, but to wrap it up and to bring it home. There's opportunity to do that. And so I don't think legacy sequels in and of themselves are bad. The problem is it's, you know, when you're working at that level and you're working for the studio system, it, it's all about money and, and product and more and more and more and more and more. And so if a legacy sequel is great, it doesn't matter if you've wrapped up the story and it's got a beginning, a middle and end and it's actually pretty good. They're like, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, fuck, just leave it, just leave it, fucking leave it. 
So with It's Me, Billy, Chapter 2, people have said, you know, do you, like, is, is there like, you know? No, it's not like Chapter 1. And that's not a spoiler. I've been open about that. Chapter 1 has a cliffhanger because you've watched half the movie. Now you're going to watch the second half of the movie. And so it wraps up. It has an ending, a final. Like, it, fe- it, it should for you feel complete. You know what I mean? And I like that. I like when stories have, be, have you know, beginning and middle and end. You know what I mean? Like, it's, you know what I mean? I hate it when fucking every movie ends on a cliffhanger. It's like, fuck. Then why am I watching this? I'll just wait. I'll just keep waiting. <laughs> I'll just wait for the one where they wrap it up. Um, but yeah, no, it can be tricky, man. It can be tricky. And, and I, again, I hate saying that because I, I, I don't, I don't mean it to sound pretentious because I'm not pretentious, but I have to be honest with how I feel about certain things. And, and, and that's how I feel, you know, I just, yeah. I think sequels, I think a sequel to a really great film can be exciting, but I don't think 70 sequels are exciting. You know, like Scream 7. Like, oh God. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that doesn't mean it's not going to be good. It's just, you know, in the initial stages, I'm just like, oh, okay, here we go again. You know what I mean? It's just, okay. You know? I don't know. Hey, pay me a billion dollars. You never know. Maybe I'll make 40. It's me, Billy. No. Uh, <laughs> could you imagine? <laughs> it's me, Billy. It's me, Billy, chapter two. What's next? It's me, Agnes. Agnes, it's me. Billy, it's me. I don't know. There's different ways you could say that. Uh, Lee the Machine Bowers sends in 1999. Thank you, Lee. Very generous of you. Really appreciate that. It says, I'm ordering me pizza for Saturday night. Can't wait. Yes. My man, Lee, ordering pizza. You gonna have pineapple on that pizza? I don't know. if you, Are you a pineapple guy? I'm not sure. Uh, but you're ordering pineapple on the pizza. I can't wait for this Saturday movie night, Friday the 13th, part four, if you want to get in on it. And remember, this is not a show you can watch live at or, you know, watch at. It's exclusive to level number two members only. We're going to have fun. This, this, sa- excuse me, did I say Friday? I meant this Saturday, this Saturday uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Aaron Click says, Dave, how does the work, uh, how does that work if someone else wants to make IMB Chapter 3, also a fan film? Since the OG property isn't yours, could they do that? Yeah, they could. 100% they could. We don't, I mean, we don't own the intellectual property, right? So if somebody wanted to do It's Me, Billy, Chapter 3, they could. The thing is, is that we feel pretty safe where we are because of the level that we were working at. It's like somebody going out and making a Never Hike Alone 3. Well, somebody could do it, but there's very few people that are making fan films at a professional level, right? So, um, you know, most fan films, and again, this is not a knock, this is just the reality. Most fan films are, you know, um, uh, amateur I don't want to say home movie. That's that's quite a, a low bar. But most fan films, even fan films that look pretty good, they still feel like fan films. They're, they're, there's a fan film vibe. There's something there. Maybe it's the audio quality. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's the lighting. Maybe it's just the way it's edited. There's something. There's a there's just you can kind of feel it. You know what I'm saying? Um, most fan films are not shooting on cinematic grade cameras and hiring professionals and, you know, and hire, you know, like, I, I mean, professionals that work in the business every day, you know, and have first ADs and second ADs and set departments and prop departments and, and, you know, and are, you know, hiring union actors and most people are not doing that. So, um, in order to be able to compete with It's Me, Billy, Chapter 1 and 2, or Never Hike Alone and Never Hike Alone, you would, if you want to go out and make a Never Hike Alone 3, well, somebody probably could, you know, somebody probably could. I mean, I I would have to speak to our entertainment lawyer because we have one, whether the name It's Me, Billy, whether we have rights to that. We might have rights to that. I'm not sure. Uh, We also may not. Uh, I'd have to speak to our lawyer on that. Um, But, you know, there's certain things we may have some say over, but at the end of the day, we don't own the rights to Black Christmas or the Billy character, right? Now, we do own the rights to the character of Sam, right? Because Sam was our creation. 
right? And so Sam, Justine, Emma, we created those characters. So I'd have to speak to our lawyer and find out how, how that works in such a fan tribute film. What do we have a say over? What don't we have a say over? We actually may have more of a say than, than we actually might think. But the property itself, the Billy character, the Agnes character, things like that, we, we don't have a say over. So actually speaking to you now and just working through it in my head, we actually might have more say than, than I first thought. Um, but anyways, the point I'm making is that, uh, that in order for somebody to be able to deliver and it's me, Billy chapter three, let's say all things considered, they, you know, they go ahead and do it. The quality they would have to deliver would, would have to be professional and, and not too many people are doing that in the fan film space. Um, because if you go out and you try to deliver a, you know, a chapter three on your phone with, you know, your friends as your actors, nobody, I mean, you know, who cares, right? You know what I mean? So, um, it's a lot of work, you know, again, I, 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 I think personally, I mean, we can't remove the fan film label from the film because legally we have to have it there because legally that is what it is. Um, but I do think that there is another tier, you know, and, and I've often said that I, I, I often refer to the Billy films as fan and tribute films, you know, I'll often, now it doesn't say that in the, in the title or on the poster or, you know, anything, but if I'm, you know, doing an interview or if I'm talking, I will often say that it's a Black Christmas fan and tribute film. It's my way of sort of associating it in a bit of a different category. And I don't, again, I don't mean that in a pretentious way. I mean that in recognizing the work we put into it, recognizing the level that we're working at, Vincent DeSanti can do the same thing. You know what I mean? When you watch Never Hike Alone or Never Hike Alone 2, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's a professional grade indie shoot, you know? And so it's a bit different, it's, it's a bit of a different category. You know, Dylan's New Nightmare, same thing. There's, there's kind of different categories or, or in my opinion, there should be a bit of a different category for, for the more higher polished fan films that, that, uh, are professionally done, you know? And, and so, um, uh, there is still a stigma obviously that comes with fan film and rightly so, because 95% of fan films are in your backyard with your friends on your iPhone. And, and that's where they will always be. But, um, the stigma of fan film, yeah, you know, it's, it's, you have to sort of, you know, cause people go, Oh, a fan film, uh, you know, and then you go, no, 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 guys, you gotta, you know, you gotta watch it. It's not, you know what I mean? Um, but, yeah, walking, you know, walking through that in my head, we, we actually might have um, a little more say than, 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 what, than what I first initially thought. But we certainly don't have the rights to like the Billy character or Agnes or anything like that. <clears throat> uh, Alley Girl says, what I would love, uh, what I would love, what I would love to, uh, would be for a production company to give you guys all of the money you need to make It's Me Billy 3. Well, I don't think we'd make It's Me Billy 3 because there is no story to make. Um, and of course we have our own production company. So what we would need then is just to, uh, join forces with another production company or a studio and, and, you know, go about it that way. Um, but listen, look, if the rights holders, to Black Christmas, ever wanted to come forward and take It's Me Billy and package it as like a special feature on an anniversary disc or something, they can do that. You know, they can do that. I, it, it's not something that I, I think, you know, you know, would go to theaters because A, it's too short, even with the, the two together. Well, with the two together, it might be 70 minutes. I'm not sure. I don't know how long chapter two is going to be yet, but the first one was 38 without credits. The next one could be close, maybe 30, 35. I mean, you know, it's a short feature at the end of the day, it might be 70, five minutes or so. Um, but it's definitely something that you could package along with the original film as like a special f feature thing. You could totally do that. You could totally do that. And maybe that's what's on the horizon for us. I have no idea. But for us, I mean, the only way that like, I mean, I guess somebody could say, well, look, how much did it cost you to make It's Me, Billy 1 and 2? And together it's about, you know, $250,000 or whatever. Well, if a studio wanted to give us, you know, $5 million to remake the whole thing for a theatrical release, you know, that's a conversation that, that, that we could have. 
um, perhaps, because then there are things that we could expand on with the Billy. Like there's things that we can't do because of our budget, you know, um, limitations, story-wise, things we'd love to explore, all that kind of stuff that maybe we could do with $5 million, right? Uh, and then the It's Me Billy films become sort of what James Wan's short movie Saw was, right? You know what I mean? Because he made a short film, like a 10-minute uh, a Saw movie, which was kind of like his, you know, pitch for, for a, you know, a larger thing. Um, I don't know. There's many different ways it could go, or nothing could happen. And they could just sit as as uh, companion pieces to the original, which I'm perfectly happy with. I mean, we're the only people to have ever done it. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that we've put into it. You know, again, they're, they're, they're professional films, you know, short films, low budget films. But when I say low budget, I don't mean amateur. I just mean low budget in terms of, you know, they're not multi-million dollar uh, films, right? The Terrifier films are low budget, you know? Insidious was low budget, you know? <laughs> you know, uh, it just means not, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. So um, I think that, yeah, I, it would be interesting. But for us on It's Me, Billy, Chapter 2, uh, we're wrapping up the story because we want to move on and do original film, like original projects. You know, we have quite a few in the, in the, in the tank that we would love to explore. With It's Me, Billy, unless the rights holders to Black Christmas come forward and package it and work with us. And then maybe there might be a way for us to make a little bit of profit. Uh, maybe they try to package it and it winds up on Amazon Prime or something, or they, you know, whatever the case is, right? Who knows? I, I'm not saying that that's going to happen. I'm just saying that that is the only way that, you know, uh, that we could make something from it. So for us, it is all about now moving on to original work where we can actually make money and seek distribution um, because we can't even seek distribution for the It's Me Billy films because they have to be watched for free. They can't end up on Prime. They can't end up on, you know, uh, Tubi. They can't, you know, as far as I know, again, we'd have to speak to our lawyer, speak to the rights holders of Black Christmas. Maybe there's some things that can work, but we can't just put them up there, right? They have to be made available for free for everybody. Um, so we want to move on and, and do original work, work that excites us where we can finally seek distribution and who knows, you know, um, that'd be a lot of fun. It'd be a lot of fun to actually finally make a movie that, that we can actually make money from. Cause again, folks, this is not hyperbolic between the first chapter and the second chapter. Like I said, it's about 220, $230,000. I think I said 250 before, but actually no, it's about 200 and 20,000, I think. Bruce and I receive nothing from that. I don't mean, that's not me saying we've received a little bit. No, it's actually zero. Zilch. We don't receive a dime, literally, in the actual pure meaning of the word, literally. Bruce and I have received nothing. Every single penny that has gone into both these films has gone into the project. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing from us at all. Even the week that we were up there shooting the film, Bruce and I took the week off work. We were not getting paid. We did the same thing in chapter one as we did with chapter two. So we're not getting paid while we're up there. We receive nothing. We are doing everything, every single thing for free because legally we have to because legally we are the producers of both films and legally the producers on these films can't make money for themselves. We can raise money to make the movie. That means paying the actors, paying the crew, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? Renting the equipment, paying the caterer, paying the, you know, the production insurance and the locations and the, the fees and the unions. And well, yes, of course, but we can't make money from the movie as the producers. So yeah, literally nothing. And so Bruce and I said, you know, once it's me, Billy. Chapter two is is in the rearview mirror. You know the amount of work we put into chapter two, especially on chapter two, because obviously there was the whole Olivia thing and everything. Um, it was a lot of work, a lot of hard work, and if we want to continue to do this, which obviously we do, um, we can't put that much work into something again and not get paid. Like we, we just can't, you know, you just can't do it. It's just, it's way too much work. I mean, you're essentially doing two jobs. 
you know, and, uh, and one of the jobs you're not getting paid. So, um, and it's not that we were complaining. I mean, we love it, right? We love making movies, but it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. And so that doesn't mean we have to get paid a lot. I'm not saying that, you know, we got to get paid millions of dollars. I'm just saying that it would be nice to move on and, and, uh, you know, uh, start, working on an original piece and raising money, whether that's crowdfunding or, or through a production company or grants or, you know, whatever the case is and raise some money and, and, and continue to, to, uh, to make movies. And, and, uh, and I just want to give a shout out to, to, uh, David Fernandez, who was our first AD on the film. He's a director here in Canada as well. And he first ADs on a lot of projects and he was our first AD on Billy chapter two. And, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but there's a, there's a short series on YouTube, and I think it went to Screenbox, if I'm not mistaken, called Creepy Bits. I did a voiceover for one of the episodes, and he directed, uh, he raised the money himself out of his own pocket, actually, and I think there were six episodes, like two or three minutes long, called Creepy Bits. Well, he has since uh, gotten a grant, I believe, of, I think it's like a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000 to start production on Creepy Bit season two. And so very excited for him. He's location scouting now. Uh, he's, and I think they're looking to raise a bit more money as well. Uh, and the episode, I, I think there's more episodes. They're going to be longer as well. So instead of three minutes, maybe six or seven minutes, I, I'm not sure. Um, but really excited for for him. So, um, but that's, that's, that's the dream, right? You know what I mean? Like there's only so much you can, but he can make money from that, right? Because it's his own original thing. And then if it really takes off, if creepy bits season two really takes off and it's, it's, I mean, who knows? Maybe there's an episode of creepy bits that somebody sees and is like, this would make a great feature film. And because David Fernandez is the creator of Creepy Bits, they're going to go to him and they're going to be like, hey, dude, we should take, you know, that episode you did, such and such and such and such. That would make a great feature film. Why don't we turn this into a feature film? And he's like, oh, and then he's off to the races, right? So you never know. You never know. But that's what Bruce and I want to start doing, you know, is not make, but I mean, like moving into the direction of creating original content and original work. But the experience on It's Me, Billy, chapter one and two have been fantastic. You know, it's been great to get our feet wet. It's been great to work at a professional level. It's been great to work with professionals um, that do this all the time. I've learned so much because as you guys know, I've spent most of my career on the voiceover side of the entertainment industry, although I do know a lot about film and went to film school. Um, but it's been really great to step in and learn from people like David and Greg and the entire crew. I'm, I'm always amazed at watching them work and, and just how proficient and efficient they are, uh, at their jobs. And, um, it's been such a wonderful learning experience. And I think I'm a better filmmaker, uh, th- three years ago after chapter one than I was before. And I think I'm a better filmmaker now having done both chapter one and two. And I, 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 I want to continue to grow and learn and, and, and get better and better. And, and, uh, there's a lot of things I learned on set in chapter two, because remember chapter one was a non-union shoot, although we ran it like a union set, uh, chapter two was full scale union. So there was a lot of different things that were happening on set. A lot of things to remember, a lot of things to, you know, a lot of paperwork, things like that. So there was a, it was a much more intense shoot and, and, uh, a lot of things I, you know, I learned with that and, and, uh, I just want to keep going, you know, I want to keep going, but I don't want to, and can't make fan films my whole life. I mean, I don't want to, as fun as they can be, uh, I actually want to make, um, you know, films that I, that are, that are original and that I can seek distribution with and that maybe you guys can watch on prime or, or hell, maybe even in a theater, right? You know, who knows? Wouldn't that be really fucking cool? That'd be amazing. That'd be amazing. So fingers crossed, fingers crossed. But, uh, but yeah, chapter two is the final one in the it's me, Billy series. And, uh, we're very proud of, of the work we've done on it. And we hope you guys, uh, we hope you guys like it. We hope you guys like it. Um, all right. What's the time here? Uh, oh, I'm uh, got a few, a few more minutes. Uh, a couple more super chats came in. Let's see here. Oliver Mercer sends in a super chat. Thank you. Oliver says, Hey Dave, have you heard about Blumhouse talk, uh, taking on the Blair Witch Project next? I'm like, come on. I have, I heard about it today. I thought, uh, I don't care. They want to reimagine it. They want to reboot it. They want to, I don't know, man. 
I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I'm not over the moon about the news, so we'll just wait and see what, we'll just wait and see. We'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. Uh, maybe I'll do a stream on it. Maybe I'll do, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but I hear you. Yeah, I feel the same way, Oliver. I feel the same way. Uh, Roberto Torres sends in a dollar ninety nine. Says, "But Dave, love your content. Take care of yourself. Thank you, thank you, Roberto. You take care of yourself as well. Thank you for the super chat, man. Really appreciate it." Um, and then we've got Nate, Nate Buck, a diddle. Nate Buck a diddle. I like it. I like the name. Sends in four ninety nine. Says, "Hey Dave, do you and Bruce plan on sticking together as filmmakers moving forward? Been wondering if you are going to continue uh, as co directors." Thanks. Great question. So, um, the short answer is no. The long answer is, of course, no. The short two short answers are no and of course. So it's two. Uh, there's two answers. So Bruce and I definitely have our own ideas for our own projects that we would like to, that, so um, Bruce has a project that he's really passionate about. And that's something that I, I'm not as passionate about the project as he is, um, but I recognize his passion for the project. And it's a great project. Uh, it's a great idea. Whether it'll be a movie or series, I don't know, but it's a really cool idea and it's relevant. It's really, especially for today. Um, but that's something that I think he should, he should spearhead, he should direct 100%. That's it. And if he wants me to come on as a producer and help out and help get it, you know, off the ground, I'd be more than happy to do that. And then, of course, as you guys know, there's Port Robinson Road. Maybe you don't know, Nate, but there's a, a passion project of mine that I've wanted to bring to life for years, nearly two dec over two decades now, called Port Robinson Road. And it's a horror film, but it's more of a horror drama thriller psychological it's not a not like a slasher movie or anything um and i've i mean i've wanted to bring that to life for over two decades and that's something that bruce totally would come on board as a producer help get it off the ground absolutely but in terms of directing the film that's me totally me um i would direct it because i've got a very clear vision for it of how I want it to go. Again, I've been with this project for two decades. I have to be the one to step into the director's chair, solo and direct it. And I also think it's good too for co-directors to direct a part. Because Bruce and I are, are when, we, when we are, and this is a good thing, when we are working together, we're, we're two alphas, right? So we're very passionate. We have great ideas. We never argue or fight, but we, we're very, uh, we're very um, uh, uh, committed to our vision and our passion, you know, and things like that, which is also why I think, which makes us work well together. But at the same time, because we're so strong in our own visions and ideas, we also want to do our own things too, and then support each other along the way. So the answer is, is, is that will we co-direct again in the future? Oh, for sure. 100% we will. And there's a couple of projects that we would like to do that on. Uh, but we also have projects where we want to direct ourselves. Um, and I think it's good for us to do that as well, to, to have the experience solo directing, to have the experience of being that guy on set solo um, and not having you know the other guy to lean on. I think it'd be a great experience challenging but a great experience so uh so the short answer is well i guess it's not short answer the long answer is is both is both um and we'll see where it goes we'll see where uh where where it takes us where it takes us um hey carl weidman says i want to see dave's supernatural movie in a theater mood and atmosphere on the big screen oh dude i would love it you know when bruce was over here the other day we were working on the post-production for it's me billy chapter two and i was telling him all about how i was doing the show you know with you guys about you know um, Port Robinson Road and the and you know the EVP the don't things like that and how it jazzed me to to start you know thinking about that project again and and um, I was telling him about a teaser trailer I you know idea that I had for it now again the great thing about the It's Me Billy films is that well there, there's a lot of great things but one of the great things about them is that we because they are fan films. Uh, and not studio released films. Um, 
we are the studio for all intents and purposes. We are the marketing department. So we have full creative control over everything. Myself and Bruce, Dark Chapter Pictures. We have full creative control over everything. That's not the case when you start climbing the ranks in, in terms of, uh, you know, the studio system and, and dollars and budgets and things like that. You know, I, I don't know how much longer I will have full creative control over the movies I want to do, right? Um, you know, I'm certainly not in a position where I can demand seniority. I, I don't you know who I am? God damn it. I'm Dave McRae, the famous Canadian director. I mean, yeah, I'm not Denny Villeneuve. Uh, he is Canadian. Um, so I'm not in a position like that at all. So I would, maybe one day, who knows? But uh, but to be in that position is, you know, I, even Denny Villeneuve is is uh, probably doesn't uh, get as much say as you might think he does, despite his movies being great. So it's one of those things where, anyways, I digress a little bit, but I was telling Bruce about this teaser trailer idea I had for Port Robinson Road. And it was full of mood and atmosphere. And and uh, and he was like, oh yeah, that's great. That's great. And it was typical, classic Bruce and Dave teaser. You know what I mean? And because uh, if you you know watch the It's Me Billy Chapter 2 teaser, that that is the epitome of a teaser. Um, I But, you know, if I'm working with you know, Blumhouse and, and I'm making a movie and, and I'm not going to have a say over that unless it's somehow built into my contract, which is unlikely to be the case. They're not going to say, oh, sure, Dave. Yeah, sure. You can you can choose how to market your movie. Like, no, 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 no. This is our movie. We're the production company. We have a first look deal with Universal Pictures. They're going to distribute the movie for you. We've given you $5 million to make this movie. We've hired you. That's enough, Dave but we're going to get a say of final cut and we're going to get a say of marketing. I mean, that is, I mean, it's not going to, you know what I'm saying? So it's been really cool to be able to be in charge of the two films. It's me, Billy one and two, and to be able to market the movies, how we want to market them. Right. You know what I mean? Because let's face it. The it's me, Billy chapter two teaser was great. You know what I mean? We put that together. Right. And of course it's typical, Dave McRae, mood, atmosphere, you know, teaser trailer. But if It's Me, Billy, Chapter 2 was released from Blumhouse, that teaser trailer would have shown the whole fucking movie. <laughs> I would have. You, you would have seen the whole movie. It would have been like three and a half minutes long. You would have seen everything. You know what I mean? And so um, that's the only shitty thing is as you move up the ranks, it's like you have to compromise with some things, right? You got to have to kind of... Yeah, uh, you know, so it's been really cool being able to, you know, pick and choose how you, you know, and what you want to put out there. But that's not always going to be the case. Um, unless, unless, well, it depends. Depends on the level of seniority and, and it depends. It depends. But anyway, yeah, no, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. Aaron Click says probably depends on the projects. Well, it, it would, and it would depend on on your your con your, your, your contract you know, what you've negotiated, right? I mean, it all it all depends. You know, John Carpenter said, yes, I will do Halloween as long as I get final edit and my name above the title. And Erwin Yablons was, Erwin Yablons was like, done, right? And that was something that I'm sure they also had to remind uh, Mustafa Akkad as well. Uh, oh, because he's the financer, right? So he, you know, and that's what you got. And that's what John Carpenter tried to do a lot you know, was to have his name above the title and things like that um, because that was important to him. But that's because he negotiated that. And so just because you're hired as a director doesn't mean that, you know, your movie is going to be marketed the way you want it to be marketed. You have no say, like generally speaking, I, I, listen, unless you're, you know, but generally speaking, a director has no fucking say in how, and in, in, in what the trailer, David Gordon Green had no say, no say. And how that he might be able to offer notes, be like, "Hey guys, you know, I hope you know." But it's the trailer houses that put them together. There's there's a lot of trailer houses that 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 will cut different trailers, and then they will compete with each other with the production company and with the studio on which one they want to pick. And then you know the studio will pick, you know, I don't know that trailer house, and and that's the one they go with or whatever the case is. That happens too. There's even competing trailer houses all vying for the one that they you know that the that the production company uses and things like that. And, and generally speaking, the director has no say, you know, which is why when they show so much in the Halloween trailers, David Gordon Green is interviewed and he's like, I hear you. 
<laughs> you know, he, hey, don't don't blame me. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, it can be tricky. It can be tricky, but you know, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool, nonetheless. Um, Will Pay uh, Pat uh, Pat. Uh, Pantier, Pantier, Will Pantier. Dave, off topic question. Have you seen the Bad Ben movies? I have not seen the Bad Ben movies. I've never heard of the Bad Ben movies. Never heard of them. Never heard of them. Um, all right, we'll take this to nine o'clock. It's 8.52. We'll take the show to nine o'clock today. Appreciate you all tuning in and hanging out with me for a little bit. Uh, we'll take it to nine o'clock. Carl Weidman has been a member for seven months. Thank you, Carl. Really appreciate that, man. And sends, uh, sends in a member chat. Says, I know you're busy with voiceover uh, work and it's me, Billy, chapter two, but I'd like to see you get going with your film as soon as possible. Uh, hey, man, I would love it too. I would love it too. Um, you know, Port Robinson Road is one of those movies that, you know, if I, if I only ever make one feature film in my life and I've never made a feature... Uh, there was, I've made obviously two professional films in my life, but they're short films, right? Billy one, Billy two, they're shorts. Um, I've never made a feature. Uh, I would love to, if, listen, I don't know where my career as a filmmaker is going to go. Nobody does. We're working hard. We're going to do our best. I'm going to do my best to make connections with the right people and work hard and, and you know, and all that kind of stuff. And working in the entertainment industry, I, I, I have, a, I guess, a bit of a leg up uh, with, with certain things um, over the average person. And I certainly don't take that for granted. However, that doesn't mean I'm going to be a successful filmmaker. Um, but I'm certainly, you know, in my mid-40s now, I'm, I'm making a go at it. And um, I would love if, if I, like, basically, if the universe said to me, Dave, you can only make one feature in your life, this would be it. This would be it. And I hope to make many features in my life, but uh, this would be it. And it would be, it's, it's a lot of work, though. It's, I mean, if I thought Billy 2 was a lot of work, because <laughs> um, this is a feature, and it's a feature, again, the script is done but it's going through rewrites as we speak, uh, some polishing and to really shape it up to what I want it to be because I've grown over the last two decades too. I mean, when I first started writing it in 2005, it's kind of like what it was in 2005, but I've grown as a human being and my life experience and how I look at that experience from my second year of college is different as well. And so the story is kind of shaping to be more mature and more, um, it's more, I hate to hate saying this because people always get the wrong impression, but it is more highbrow than uh, like a, your run of the mill haunted house film. You know what I mean? Like it has meat on it. It has, it's, it's got philosophical, it, listen, I want it to be, and it will be scary and moody and atmospheric and like the mood and the atmosphere will, will be dripping. It will be dripping. You know what I'm saying? But it's not, you know, a run-of-the-mill haunted house flick. It's 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 got meat there. It's it's got there, there's substance. There's philosophical questions. There's there's you know what I mean. There's a maturity to it. Um, and that's not kind of what it, it kind of was like that when I started writing it, but as I've grown and I've matured over the years, so has my outlook on what I think it should be and what I really want it to be. Um, and, but you know, it's probably a film that's going to cost a few million dollars to make. This is not likely something I could crowdfund. If I was Chris Stuckman and had 2 million subscribers, sure, I could probably crowdfund this, uh, <laughs> but I'm not him. And uh, so I don't think I would turn to crowdfunding for this, maybe partially for some reason, you know, for something. Uh, but this is likely something that, you know, we'd have to join forces. We'd have to raise money through a grant or some sort of investor or multiple investors would have to come on board or join forces with another production company or studio. You know what I mean? Like there would have to be a joint, a joint effort. Um, and, uh, you know, it would, it's probably like a, it's not a, a big budgeted film, but it's probably like a you know five million dollar movie, ten million dollar movie. Maybe. It's probably somewhere in there. Maybe, maybe I don't know. I mean, the script's not completely done yet, and you know it hasn't been combed through to figure out how much it would cost. So, um, 
but it's not going to, it's, it's going to cost more than $140,000. I can tell you that. So, um, but yeah, we'll see, man. We'll see. I want to do it, man. I want to do it. And thank you for the support. I really appreciate it. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, all right. Just a couple more minutes here. Have I, um, have I got all the super chats? I think I have. Let me see here. Yes, I've got all the super chats. Just want to make sure I've got them all. Just want to make sure. Um, Alex Shambach says, Dave, do directors typically have the largest say in who is casted or is that completely separate? Um, well, again, you know, it's not black and white, right? So um, it can depend on, I'm assuming you're talking about the studio system. Okay, so Hollywood movies. It can depend, right? The studios will often you know, a lot of decisions are made by committee, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of meddling. The studios may have their ideas and their, you know, vision to who they want in there. And then the director has his or her vision of who they want cast. And then there can be a battle. You know what I mean? They, they can fight for, you know, you know, um, a person and, and, and things like that. So does the director have final say on who is cast in a movie? Not necessarily. Um, they can, have if they're very persuasive and they're able to if there is um um if there is a a uh resistance from the studio sometimes there isn't sometimes they can they just they don't care you know cast whoever you want you know they're not emotionally attached for whatever reason and then sometimes again the meddling isn't there isn't like studio meddling isn't the same with every studio it's not the same with every project it varies for, for a variety of different reasons. And so sometimes you have a lot of creative control and, you know, you get notes from the studio, you get notes from the, you know, executive producer or, you know, whatever the case is. Um, but maybe that's about it. And then sometimes there's like a lot of meddling. Like Harvey Weinstein used to meddle a lot, you know? And it's like, fuck, like get the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? And... So it, it, it really depends. It really depends. Does the director have the, the final say on set? Yes. The director is the CEO on set. Now, he doesn't run the set. The first AD runs the set. But the director is the, like, I mean, if the first AD said, uh, okay, you know, we got it. We got to get this. Uh, we got it. We got to, we're going to. And the director was like, I need five more minutes. He gets five more minutes. It doesn't matter what the first AD wants. The director gets five more minutes. Um, but the first AD runs the set. So they make sure that everybody is there, but he's, everything's working, everything's happening, things like that. And you need a first AD. <laughs> you do. Um, and, uh, but the director is, is in charge of the set They're, They work closely with the director of photography and the first and, you know, the first AD or sometimes the second AD, third AD. Obviously the first AD is the one who's working closely with the second and third AD. Sometimes there's a fourth and fifth AD, depending on how big the project is. Um, but, on our project, because it was a small, you know, low budget indie short film in one location, we only, you know, had one AD, uh, which was sufficient. But uh, but the director runs this. Uh, the director is gets final say. They're directing the actors. That's their job is to get the best performance out of the actors. You know, work with the DP to create the vision, uh, create the tone on set uh, along with the first AD. Um, you know, and, and just really sort of make sure that they're working closely with the, with the DP in getting what the director wants, you know, the vision of what they see in their minds, that shots, compositions, you know, movement, lighting, you know, performances, all that kind of stuff. And then the first AD is the one that handles everything else. You know what I mean? Uh, making sure that the set is running smoothly. Your, you know, the actors are there on time. Uh, you know that you're starting on time, that you're ending on time, that you're taking your breaks on time, that you're taking lunch on time, uh, and that if you have to go into overtime, that you know everybody's aware of it. It's a, it's a, it's a big job. First AD is a big job. Watching David work on our set, and our set was one location, low budget indie shoot, but watching him work because he's a professional. Uh, he was, he was on his game. He was, he was. He was running that set like it was the Avengers. I mean, it was, you know what I mean? Like it, you know, I mean, obviously I'm being a little sarcastic, but he was, he was legit. He was legit. And it was my first time and Bruce's first time working with a first AD. So that was a whole experience in and of itself. Um, and really cool, you know, and every, you know, and everybody's different. You have some first ADs that are, that are, that are more on the drill sergeant side that are really like, you know, and some might be a little more not so and, you know, whatever the case is, right? But, uh, um, yeah, 
Uh, but yes, the 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 director has final say on the set in terms of, you know, performances. And if the director wants to do another take and the first AD is like, okay, but we got, okay, but, you know, we're going to be going into our lunch if we do another take. And the director's like, I, you know, he or she can say, I understand that, but I, I, I need to get this. I need, you know what, you know, I got it. You know what I mean? And it's like, ah, yeah, hey, that's, that's the director's call. That's the director's call. Um, but again, I'm, I'm speaking very generally, right? Like generally, that's how it usually goes. Um, but there's many different variables that can happen on set. And whether a set is stressful, whether a set is relaxed, you know, it, I mean, it, it all depends on, on the personalities of the crew, uh, the location, uh, the movie you're making, the the... You know, it, it, there's many different variables, whether there's meddling from the top coming down, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's not a, it, it's not a one size fits all, right? There's many different experiences making movies. Uh, sometimes you can make a movie that was, Hey, pretty chill. Like it's me. Billy chapter one was pretty chill. It's me. Billy chapter two was a lot more stressful. You know what I mean? Because there was a lot of things happening, a lot of wheels turning. We're now moving into the climax of the movie. So there's more wheels turning, more set pieces, more, you know what I'm saying? Like there's more stuff going on and you know, we're, it's a union shoot, first AD, this coming in, you got, I mean, it was, yeah, you know what I'm saying? So um, it depends on a number of factors. Happy Sanjo says, you have any plans for, uh, for a 30K sub video? Thank you for the super chat. Happy, appreciate it. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think I will... You know, early on, I used to celebrate like 5,000, 7,000, 10,000. I think I did a 25,000 one. I don't think I'm going to celebrate 30. Um, I don't know. I, it just kind of feels like, I mean, maybe, maybe, I don't know. It's 30. You know, it's not 100. I'll celebrate when we get to 100, if we ever get to 100. If we ever get to 100. Um, all right. Do I have all the Super Chats? I think I did, folks. This is going to do it. Yes. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of McRae Live. Thank you to everybody that tuned in. Hey, if you're watching live or after the fact, jump into the comment. Oh, hey, I got to stop the poll. Got to stop the poll. I almost forgot about the poll. Forgot the poll. The poll. The final results of the poll, ladies and gentlemen, is it a child's play and Chucky reference or just one of the biggest coincidences of all time? And of course, this is what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about, hang on a sec. Uh, let me just get this back. I'm talking about this here. All right, folks, here we go. Oh, one second. That didn't, uh, hang on a sec. Here we go. Child's play, Lieutenant. By the morning, please. There it is. Child, you have Brad Dorf in The Exorcist 3 saying, Child's play, Lieutenant, a hard cut to a little red-headed freckled kid in a wheelchair. I mean, come on. Is that a Child's play reference? I don't know. Is it a Child's play and Chucky reference or just one of the biggest coincidences of all time? Absolutely a reference. 61% of you. Nah. Just a gigantic coincidence. 38%, 117 of you voted. Let me know in the comment section below what you think. Folks, thank you for tuning in today for episode 251. Thank you to all uh, the super chats that came in today. Really appreciate it. The members, of course. Thank you to my members. You are all amazing. Uh, a reminder, level number two members this Saturday night, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Friday the 13th, part four, Horror Movie Nights Watch Along. We're celebrating the 40th anniversary. That is going to be fun. Thank you to my great moderators, Frank Riker, Tap of the Short, Darren Sands, Chris Baber, Cody Snyder, and Andrew Stevens. Thank you for doing what you guys do. I really appreciate it. That is going to do it for this episode. Have a great time. A great time? I don't know. Have a great Wednesday night, folks. Have a great Wednesday night, and uh, I will see you all soon. That'll do it for me. In the meantime and in between time, I will talk to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>